I have 28 slides. No, nobody even flinched when I said that. Okay. 30 seconds of slide. We're done in 14 minutes. That's right. I just have to tell you when the 14 minutes begins, at what point that starts. Several of my slides are quotes, so they won't take very long. Um, we're going to dig deep tonight and, and ask the question about musical instruments. Uh, we were talking about this some on Wednesday night, um, a couple of Wednesdays ago, and the question was brought up, why can't we do a digging deeper on this and spend a little bit more time talking about it, reminding ourselves of some reasons why we do certain things and maybe learning something new along the way. And so uh, some of the questions that normally come up are, are they optional? Is this a matter of opinion, the use of instruments? And what does the Bible say with regard to instruments? So this is what we're going to look at this evening. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, Father, so much for the blessings of this day and for uh, the amazing time of worship that we've had, the fellowship that we've enjoyed and the remembrance of your precious Son and the way you demonstrated your love to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us another opportunity as well as the health to enjoy gathering together tonight. We ask your blessings to be upon us as we learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin by looking at the testimony of history with regard to to instruments. This quote from Clement of Alexandria from 195 AD, let the pipe be resigned to the shepherds and the flute to the superstitious ones who are engrossed in idolatry. It, do it doesn't sound like he was in favor of the use of instruments, does it? This is one of the early church writers. Now we're getting outside of the apostolic age and we're getting to the time where they have received the writings from the apostles and they're beginning to examine those things and put those things into practice all over the known world let us take up hymns instead of timbrels psalmody instead of lewd dances and songs thankful acclamation instead of theatrical clapping this is from Gregory of Nazianus who lived in the 4th century He speaks against timbrels, dancing, and clapping. All of things, strangely enough, are current issues that people are discussing in the church. You know, those who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. And we've we got to go back and we've got to see what, whose people, the shoulders we stand on, what they believe. Our next quote, I've got all these sheets of paper up here, so forgive me. Only the corporal institutions have been rejected, like circumcision, the Sabbath, sacrifices, discrimination in foods. So too the trumpets, harps, cymbals, and timbrels. For the sound of those, we now have a better substitute in the music from the mouths of men. Nasida, a bishop, and Remesania. And this quote is from around the year 370. And here, this is the context here is what we left behind in Judaism and what we now have in Christianity. It is not simple singing that belongs to the childish state, but singing with lifeless instruments, with dancing and the, with clappers. Hence, the use of such instruments and others that belong to the childish state is excluded in the churches, and simple singing is left. This is Theodoret, a bishop in Sarhus from around the year 400. And you can see, he is talking about the childish state versus the mature state. Where do we read about that? How about Galatians 3? When we were a child, we were under the tutor, the law. But having been brought to Christ, we are no longer under the tutor. So this, that is his reference point 
with the doctrinal issue regarding worship. And he says part of the childish state was lifeless instruments, dancing, and clappers. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's brief, but it makes a very strong point. The organ is an ensign of Baal. Martin Luther is quoted as saying that. The organ is an ensign of Baal. This next quote, there's no more authority for it, that is the use of instruments, than there is for the burning of incense and the other shadows of the law. The Catholics borrowed it from the Jews. That quote is from John Calvin. You're going to recognize some of these names, I'm sure. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of the quartet, the refined necessities of the choir, or the blowing off of the wind from inanimate bellows and pipes. That's Charles Spurgeon, probably the most famous Baptist preacher ever. He preached to a congregation of over 10,000 in the late 19th century in London, England. And you can see the sarcasm in that statement that he's making. So, what I want you to think about, these men are not inspired. But these men are, in fact, building off of what they know is right and understanding where the abuses came from and how those abuses need to be set aside to get back to what it was we were intended to be. The sad state is that many of these individuals, especially these later individuals, there were religious groups founded upon their teachings that now do the exact thing that they are teaching against here in these quotations. The history of instruments... I'm going to give a very, very brief history because so we can move forward with our lesson. First introduced into Catholic worship by a priest of Rome around the year 670, it created such a stir that they removed it immediately. Finally, around the year 800, you see widespread use of mechanical instruments in the Catholic Church. Now, we're 800 years removed basically, from Christ's ministry on earth. Before it became common for instruments to be used. Many will tell you that the reason they didn't use instruments is because of the fear of persecution. The persecution ended in 320. And yet, several of these quotations are after the persecution ceased. It had nothing to do with persecution. It had to do with their understanding of how the right way to approach God was. In 1054 A.D., the Greek Orthodox Church, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, split from the Catholic Church over two primary issues. One was papal authority, that is the authority of the Pope. The Greek Orthodox Church did not believe that they were subject to papal authority that there was no biblical authority for that. And the second issue was the introduction of instruments in worship. The Greek Orthodox Church to this day is still a cappella. They still don't use instruments. And that's a very brief history of instruments. So what does the New Testament teach? Well, it's important for us to recognize where we gain our authority. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So anything that we are authorized to do would have to come through Jesus if he, post-resurrection, had been granted all authority. Would you agree? Okay, if he has all authority, that's where we need to go. What does Jesus then teach us with regard to authority. In 
John 14 and verse 10, this is his long conversation he has the night he was betrayed. He's having this conversation with his disciples. He says, do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Where did Jesus gain his authority? From the Father. So if Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, he is speaking on behalf of the Father. There is not division between them where that is concerned. As we slip down a little bit further in the chapter, verses 16 and 17, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. When you go over to chapter 16, look at verses 13 and 14. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, this is a very important point to make here. So far, we have... Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Then he says, I do not speak on my own authority, but I speak on the Father's authority. He then says, the Holy Spirit is going to come, talking, to his, talking about his apostles, is going to come to you and guide you into all truth, but he won't speak on his own authority either. He's going to speak on what he has heard. So you've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one, two, three, in line Authority coming from the top, making its way down. And where is the Holy Spirit going to deliver that authority? He's going to do that, according to Jesus, to the apostles. He's going to come and teach them and remind them of things. When we get over into Acts chapter 2, we recognize the point at which the apostles receive this incredible gift. Jesus had told them in Acts chapter 1, remain in Jerusalem until you receive power from the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in, with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. At this point, the Holy Spirit comes with power. We see a crowd gathers. We see this amazing sermon being preached, and 3,000 souls were baptized that day. In verse 42, following this mass conversion that takes place, Luke records for us, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. The apostles' doctrine. Where did they get their doctrine? They got it from the Holy Spirit, who was going to guide them into all truth. Where did the Holy Spirit get that doctrine? He received it from Jesus Christ, to whom all authority had been given in heaven and on earth. Where did Jesus get his authority? He received it from the Father. From the Father to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the Apostles. Those of you who have experience in the military see exactly what that is. That is called a chain of command. And anywhere along that chain of command, when a command is given, everybody underneath is bound by that command. So the Apostles, as they speak guided by the Spirit and write guided by the Spirit, are writing... God the Father's words. They're not making this stuff up as they go along. They are writing and they are speaking and they are practicing the things that God has given them in the Christian age. In Acts 20, in verse 20, the Apostle Paul makes an interesting statement. As he's speaking to the elders from the church in Ephesus, he says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, 
but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. While he was there with them, what did he hold back as far as teaching was concerned? Apparently nothing. He, he is teaching them all of these things. This is going to be very important as we move forward. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. Paul is writing to the evangelist Timothy. Timothy had been the located preacher in Ephesus, the same place that these elders were from. And he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. When we are complete, we're lacking nothing. You don't add anything to it. If in the first century, in the seventh decade of the first century, all scripture was there for our doctrine to make us complete and it came from God through Jesus through the Holy Spirit what do we add to that there's nothing that can be added to that because it's from God God has made us complete second Peter verses uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 by his divine power is given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness he's given us all things if he gave us all things what's left out nothing there's nothing left out so as you see this this walk the apostles doctrine following the time and it's not their doctrine it's the doctrine they taught you understand that from the time of the holy spirit they're teaching and they're holding back nothing from those they're teaching. They're not just giving them little pieces. They're giving them everything that they need for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, for correction so that they can be complete. They're withholding nothing. They're delivering to them all things that pertain, all things related to, all things that are useful for life and godliness. Do you not think that at some point in time there would have been some discussion about what they could and could not use in their worship services? Maybe once or twice they would have talked about these things. If they're holding back nothing, that means they're holding back nothing. So let's look at what their instructions are with regard to uh, music. And, and one of the things, if you say this, I, I'm not being overly critical, but I would like to caution you to change the way that you use this phrase. Well, you know, we don't have music in the church. Yes, we do. It's vocal. It's not instrumental. We have music in the church. And then people will usually follow, well, you know what I mean. No, I know what you said. We have music in the church. And we're instructed to, to have music in the church. The type of music that we are to have is what we're about to, to investigate. In Ephesians 5.19, backing up to verse 18, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. This is the way that the pagans worshipped. The, the Roman god Bacchus was the god of wine. Care to take a guess on how you would worship Dionysus or Bacchus, depending on whether you're following the Greek or the Roman god. How do you think you would worship the god of wine? You would get smashed. That's how you did it. I guess it's a good gig if you can get it. But that, that's what they did. How, how do you worship the goddess of love? You would go purchase a prostitute in the temple. This, this is the mindset of the first century world. And God comes in through his son, and he says, enough is enough. Let's get back to what God created us to be and to do. And so the instruction, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, is an instruction regarding the way the pagans worshipped. 
but be filled with the Spirit. Rather than being filled with an intoxicating substance, be filled with the Spirit of God speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The parallel passage to that in Colossians chapter 3 reads, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, as we examine the place that the melody is being made it is in the heart that melody comes from the heart what did paul say to the ephesian elders in acts 20 and verse 20 i did not hold back anything for you that was useful what is he reiterating here in this passage your singing is wonderful as a matter of fact, it is the exact opposite of what the pagans are doing. You're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in your heart. That is, that is the instrument, the root instrument that it springs forward from, from our hearts. You know, this morning at the opening of our worship service, I mentioned that, you know, worship is, is not just an act of faith, it's an act of love. And our singing is an act of love. A love for each other because we're teaching and admonishing one another, but we're also praising God. It's an act of love when we sing. It's a very important thing to remember. In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, and when this word sing, which is uh, in the previous slide right here, you can see the Greek word pasalo. The P is actually pronounced in the Greek language. It's not solo like we would say psalm, but pasalo. Pasalo, and let me go back and, and investigate this word. I didn't plan on doing this, but since I brought it up, I, I like word studies. And there, if you ever need some bedtime reading, I have a 10-volume set, The Theological Dictionary of New Testament Words. And it is done in, the, in German, translated from the Greek, and it follows the beginning of a word, its use at the beginning, through the Old Testament, through the intertestamental period, into the New Testament, and into the post-apostolic age. And it shows how the word evolves over time and how it is used. And it's translated into English, and it's ten volumes, and it's every word and it does that for every word that we have in the New Testament. Now, I'm a word nerd. I admit it. And I'll go in and I'll be studying a word, and the next thing you know, I'm 50 pages into reading something that had nothing to do with what I was talking about. Because it just interests me to see how words develop and how they're used. Pasalo. The original use of Pasalo was the plucking of a carpenter's line. That's how the word was first used. And it became to be the plucking of an instrument, as we see it being used in the Old Testament. This, the peculiarity of this word is that it always, when this word is used, it always tells you the instrument to pluck. Always, without fail. And so in Ephesians 5.19 and in Colossians 3.16, what is the instrument we're to pluck? The heart. We pluck the strings of our heart. That's literally what that verse is telling us to do, to pluck the strings of our heart. Now, as you look at a further use of this word in 1 Corinthians 14.15, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. And I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. The word sing there twice is pasalo. So we see in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 that we are to pluck the instrument of our heart. Here, we are to pluck the instrument of our spirit and our mind. 
you see where this is heading? Your inward person is an instrument that you use in praise to God. Your mind. Now, this is something that we, we've got to work on. And I mean we collectively. Because the mind or the intellect or the understanding is what this word is that is used here. Which tells us that we need to have a good understanding of what we are singing. Now, those of you that grew up on the King James Bible can probably understand most of the hymns that we sing. Our newer generations did not grow up on the new King James Bible, nor did they study English and American literature in school anymore, which the majority of which was based on the Bible teaching. So they don't read Shakespeare anymore. And there's lots of words that have gone the way of the dodo or the telegraph or the Pony Express. And when we sing those words, we are reducing the understanding among many people, and we need to be careful about that. Here I raise my Ebenezer. I love the song. Very few people know what an Ebenezer is. Some people think it's a mug they drink the root beer out of. Here I raise my Ebenezer. It's actually a stone of help. And you're raising that stone and praying to God. Here I raise my Ebenezer. That's what that means. If we don't understand it, we're singing without understanding. That is one of the instruments we are eliminating. And we need to be careful. Likewise, we need to make sure that the songs that we sing make sense theologically. While there is always room for poetical license, and we need to be careful about being song Nazis. You know, and every time there's one word and we want to just lose our minds over it, that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about, does it make, is it theologically sound? Does it make sense theologically? And I'm probably going to hurt somebody's feelings here, but I'm going to say it anyway. The song, Days of Elijah, is theologically bankrupt. The song, Days of Elijah, is a song where they've taken phrases from the Old Testament unrelated to each other and put it in a catchy song. And none of those verses relate to one another. These are the days of David building a temple of praise. Can somebody find where he built a temple of praise in the Bible? Matter of fact, he was prevented from building the temple. Need to be real careful about what we sing. And then the chorus, Behold, he comes riding on the cloud, and we sing it with just joy and all this kind of stuff. Folks, when Jesus comes riding on the cloud, there will be no joy. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 6 through 9, and see what happens when Jesus comes riding on the clouds. It is a day of destruction and judgment. It's not something we should be happily singing about. Because the majority of the people who have ever lived will all be destined for hell. When Jesus comes with his holy angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is not a pleasant thing to sing about. But we need to be careful about singing songs that make no sense. It's a fun song to sing. It's a catchy tune. But when we think about it, if we're going to sing with our mind, that's a song that's going to be very difficult for us to sing. So the two instruments that are specified here are our spirit and our mind. When you look at Hebrews 13, 15, Therefore, I will continually offer the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of of my lips lips mouth what do we see taking place here we see the heart we see the spirit we see the mind and we see the lips this is what's important because these are the only instructional passages 
that tell us how to sing. Now we have in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas singing a hymn at night in prison. It's not an instructional passage when it comes to singing. The singing is incidental to what's happening there. We, get an, we see the example, but it's not instructing us to do anything with regard to our singing. These passages we've looked at are instructional. They're written to Christians to tell them how they are to sing. Now, what do we have that we are authorized to use in song? Spirit, mind, heart, lips. In other words, we are the instrument. You remember one of the quotes that says, we put away all these things for the better sound of the human voice, the human song? We're talking about the early Christians are saying these things. Where did they get that idea from? Go to your chain of command once again. Where did they get the idea? They got it from the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles who wrote and taught and passed those things down to us. Now, here's one of the things that I want us to be very careful about, and that's let's looking at the objections to not using instruments. One of the objections is the Bible doesn't say that we can't use instruments. This is one of the most nonsensical objections imaginable because you would never function anywhere in the world by this premise. You would never tell a state trooper, the sign doesn't say, I, I didn't tell me not to go 90 miles an hour. Try it. Try it. It's not going to work. You know why? Because it's a dumb argument. The instrument, it doesn't say that we can't use instruments. Here's a biblical principle. I'll throw this in for free. This is a, a principle of interpretation. When there is a generic command, if the command was just sing, then we may be able to sing with or without. When there is a specific command, sing with heart, sing with lips, sing with mind, sing with spirit, that eliminates everything else. When God speaks generically, it leaves us freedom. When he speaks specifically, he locks us in. Because by telling us what to do, he eliminates everything else. Example, Genesis 6.14. Make an ark of gopher wood. God did not list every other species of wood on the planet not to use. He told them the one to use. That eliminates all the others. That's a basic principle of interpretation. He didn't say go build an ark of wood. Because then he could have used any old wood he wanted to. God said go for wood. And so he told his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, go for wood. Some of you will catch that later. In Luke 22, 17 through 19, Jesus at the Passover meal takes two elements at the Passover meal, and he brings our attention to those, saying to, about the unleavened bread, this is my body, and the fruit of the vine, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. We have it on the front of our table right here. This is what we do on the first day of the week. Now, what did he tell us to use? Unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. We have it prepared tonight for any that we're unable to take this morning. It remains prepared. It's the same that we had this morning. It's the same that we had last week, last year, 10 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. Why do we not use anything else? Because Jesus was specific. Use the bread, unleavened, not any bread, unleavened bread. Use the fruit of the vine. Not any other, not milk, not water, but fruit of the vine. And there you have it. He was specific. Well, he didn't say, I couldn't use filet mignon. He didn't say, I couldn't use, and 
Captain Crunch cereal. We could pick up the Captain Crunch cereal and use it. It's already in little pieces anyway. You know, if God had to tell us everything not to do, it would be a long list of books so big we couldn't even carry it around with us. But when he specifies what to do, that eliminates everything else. It's a very plain principle. And the objection that it doesn't say we can't use instrument does not hold water. What about the use of instruments in the book of Revelation? Both Revelation 14, 2 through 3, and Revelation 15, 1 through, 5, 1 through 3 are discussing in highly symbolic language a vision that John was having around the throne of God. What happens around the throne of God is not necessarily permissible on earth in the church. Secondly, when you notice in those two passages how highly symbolic everything is that's going on there, the harps that are being held are never said to be played. It never says they play their harps. You know what the harps are? The harps are the symbolism for the songs of praise. Because it says, and they sang. It doesn't say, and they played. The symbolism of the heart is the beauty of the song. They never play it. Plus, if that's instructive for the New Testament church today, guess what everybody in those scenes had? A harp. That would mean, if it's instructive, every person in the assembly would have to play an instrument. If you're going to follow that as being instructive. It's not an instructive passage. We're looking at things that are highly symbolic. Just like when you get to Revelation 19, and that serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan, as he is described, is bound by a chain. And I want to ask you a question. Do you think Satan... A spiritual being can be bound by a physical chain, a literal chain? Or do you think that's symbolic of something else? It would have to be symbolic of something else. So when you look in Revelation, you try to literalize the things that are being said there, you're going to get yourself in all kinds of problems. Colossians 5.19, or excuse me, Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 are not talking about worship. I've heard that argument from members in the church. I've heard it time and again. That's not talking about worship. Pray tell at what point would the Christians in Ephesus and the Christians in Colossae be assembled together? Think about it. Did they have jobs? Did they have homes? They didn't have washing machines. They didn't have dishwashers. So they spent a lot of time doing chores around the house. They spent a lot of time working. They spent a lot of time with their animals or in their shops or wherever they were. And how could you fulfill the encouragement to sing to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs if you were not assembled together? You can't. They couldn't get on a conference call. Because back then it was just two-way lines. I'm just seeing if anybody's paying attention. You, you understand the logic here, right? When can you fulfill a one another passage of this variety? Do you think they just went down the street and were just singing as they went by people's shops? And, they were, and then they would sing back to them? Now, the same people that make this argument are the same ones that say they didn't use instruments for fear of persecution, but they're going to walk down the street and sing to each other? You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Folks, to one another means they were assembled together when they did this. When did they assemble together? When they came together for instruction and worship. David was a man after God's own heart, and he used instruments. Well, that settles it, doesn't it? David also was involved in animal sacrifices and the burning of incense. Are we going to promote that in the church? What about polygamy? He was engaged in polygamy. Most of the guys are looking at me like, one's enough.
Most of the wives are saying, no way. I mean, seriously, are we going to argue for polygamy because of David? Why not? We're arguing for instruments because of David. Well, you know, there's some things about David that we need to understand. I'm going to put these verses up here. We're not going to read them. I'm going to give you a very brief synopsis. 1 Samuel 18, verse 6, 1 Chronicles 15, 16, chapter 16, 42, 23, and verse 5 are all speaking to the idea David plays an instrument, but he never plays it in the tabernacle. And when you get to 1 Chronicles, guess who's playing in the tabernacle? The Levites. And the Levites' instruction was extremely specific with instruments when which ones how everything was very specific on how they used their instruments and the levites were the only ones david even called the levites to come play songs of of worship david by himself listen i've got a guitar i haven't picked it up in a while because well I've been down to, to nine fingers for a while, and I'm having, still having a hard time. But I'm not going to play it here. This young man right here plays in the marching band at school. We're going to just march them in here. Some of you may play piano. You may play other instruments. God bless you. I, I love the sound of instruments. I think they're fascinating. They're beautiful. But they have no place in the worship of God's people in the Christian age. David called for the Levites because he knew he couldn't play in those circumstances. And in Nehemiah, during the dedication of things, they, who did they call? They called the Levites to come in. David was of the tribe of Judah. He couldn't play instruments in the temple to God. Neither could those of Reuben, Simeon, Gad, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Asher, keep going all the way down the line, keep going. None of them. Benjamin, only the Levites were permitted under the old law. Which brings us to a very peculiar word, a cappella. And some of you have heard this before. Some of you, it may be new. But we, we know, when we go to the dictionary, it's unaccompanied by instrumental music, a cappella. You know, we see talent shows today, and they ask the people to sing a cappella because they want to hear their voice. They don't want to hear them covered up, and they want to see if that person's got a good voice so they can move on in the talent show. The word a cappella literally means in the manner of the chapel or the manner of the church. Go all the way back to the Latin with it, and you'll find out that's what the word means what was the manner of the church 2,000 years ago unaccompanied by instruments voice only why was it voice only because the father gave authority to the son who gave authority to the spirit who gave authority to the apostles who then spoke and wrote and guided us and our ancestors in the faith into how we should worship As we wrap it up, Colossians 3, 16, which we looked at a few moments ago, combined with the following verse, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus means by his authority. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do in word or deed, would that include our singing? It absolutely would. We only need to do the things for which we have authority that comes down from God. That is a long lesson. I actually shortened it simply because it, there's, there's so much historical evidence and a lot of other things you can go to. If we'd have read all of those Scriptures from First and Second Chronicles, we'd be here a long time. But make note of those things. Go back and read them for yourself.
and see what they say. We're blessed to have been given instruction on how to do the things we need to do to be pleasing to God. So we don't have to figure it out on our own. We get to do what we've been told to do. You just have to have a heart to do what God's asked us to do. And that's all it takes. Having a heart for Him. Wanting to please Him. You know, if you wanted to please one of your parents, if you wanted to please your spouse, if you wanted to please a good friend, what would you do? You would do what it is that they needed or what they wanted. That's how you would please them. Does our God not deserve even better than that? Certainly He does. Our brother's prepared a song for us tonight. Give me the title again. I've, I've drawn a blank. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Thank you. I was thinking, hallelujah, what a Savior, but that's the song after that. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Beautiful song written by Isaac Watts in the 1700s. A young man who didn't like the songs they were singing in church came home complaining to his father. You know, his father said, if you don't like the songs, why don't you write your own? So he did. And our hymnals today, over 300 years later, are still filled with songs from Isaac Watts. Alas, and did my Savior bleed as one of those. How shall the young secure their hearts? And many other songs you would recognize. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. What a beautiful song. What a great message that song sends. As we sing this song, we are going to be speaking to one another. We're going to be teaching one another. And we're going to be admonishing one another. What a beautiful thing to do with our voices, with our bodies as our instrument, praising God and encouraging each other. If you have a need tonight for prayer or for encouragement, we'd love to help you. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, we'd love to help you with that as well. But whatever your need is, please make it known to us as together we stand and sing tonight.